morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, in the chat, I have the bit.ly so that you can access the slide deck because you'll probably want some of the slides in here. And there are some things where you're going to be looking at some links and working with each other. So be sure that you're able to access those slides in the chat. There's only four of us today, so I was going to have us do some breakout rooms, but since we only have the four of us together, um, we can just stay a whole group today. But if in the chat you can just type your name, grade, and school that you're going to be working at for the next year, um, that would be great so we can all know each other in case we're from different schools. So I'll give a minute or two for you to type your grade, school, a name in the chat. Well, your name comes up. Are we all from Newburgh today? Well, there we are. Yes, all Newburgh people. Well, welcome. Nice to have you all. Um, the last couple I've had like all Olmstead North. So, yeah, <laughs> this is exciting. So. If you haven't been to one of our sessions, this is not a webinar. You're not, you're not going to just hear me talk the entire time. You're going to be talking to each other through the chat and breakout rooms. Um, if it stays these four, we'll just do whole group. We won't do breakout rooms. Um, but we're very interactive. We don't like just sitting and, and listening. So with that, we have some norms that we usually stick to. So take a second to um, read through those norms. Okay, and then our objective for today is to identify and begin planning backpack artifacts within the IM program. So here we go. Good morning. So the purpose of the backpack is to engage every student every day in meaningful learning. That's the whole goal of the Backpack of Success Skills. And so that's one of the primary reasons that I am, and then many schools, some schools use CPM, especially in high school, are our primary resources because the opportunities built into the program provide those meaningful learning experiences on a daily basis. So I want you to think about what makes an artifact worthy to be put in the backpack. So what is it, what are those qualities we are looking for? And you should be able to access the Jamboard, and you're going to use a yellow post-it to write down what makes a backpack artifact worthy, an artifact worthy to be put in the backpack. Has everybody used Jamboard? If you haven't, over on the left side here, you'll click here for a sticky note, and we're using yellow, so keep it on yellow. And you'll type what it is that you want to say, and then click Save and it'll pop up and you just click off that box to get back here, okay? So I'm going to give you about three minutes to type up some post-its of what makes an artifact worthy to be put in the backpack. Your time begins now. Okay, so we have a few things. So an artifact that requires students to use, apply, and engage in the material they're working with and something that they are proud of. We have that both on the Jamboard and in the chat, excited and proud of. And communication and collaboration instead of just testing skills. So back in our slide deck, we're going to explore some th items that will help us clarify what, is, uh, what else could be a backpack artifact. So on slide eight, in mathematics, we have, this is our deeper learning stool. In order to have deeper learning and rigor in mathematics, you have to have a balanced program between conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, and application and deep problem solving. A lot of what, when you hear projects, a lot of projects actually only focus on this application. So we're not even looking at the conceptual understanding or that procedural fluency. And so when we explore what we're doing today, I want you to think about this balance between the conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, and application. Where you see that 
in the IM program, and so where could we pull backpack artifacts from? Okay, so thinking of that this stool will help. And just a reminder that being fluent means students flexibly choose among methods and strategies to solve contextual and mathematical problems. And they're able to explain their approaches and produce accurate answers efficiently. It's not just about being accurate and fast. Efficient and flexibility are a huge proponent of being fluent. That means that based on the problem, this strategy is what I choose because it's more efficient instead of this strategy. And it is not always an equation or the algorithm that we go to as adults. For a student, it may be the use of a tape diagram. It may be the use of the powers of 10. So having that flexibility to go between those strategies is really key. Here on slide nine, there are three documents here. So I'm going to allow you five minutes on your own, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about them to explore them. And I want you to review the documents and think about the balance of the math program and what it could look like, sound like, and feel like for students. So what might a quality artifact look like, feel like, and sound like for students? So you have backpack worthy artifacts from the um, new normal. You have the quality work protocol to explore. And you also have the performance outcomes. And I hope you guys have seen these performance outcomes. Uh, they were just released last year to the AICs and they were supposed to share with everybody. But the, this is kind of like the rubric for that eighth grade defense um, that students have to be able to show that there are each of these backpack of success skills. Yes, we're on slide nine. Okay, so I'm gonna give you about five minutes to explore those three different artifacts or three different uh, documents, and then we'll discuss what might a quality artifact look like, feel like, and sound like for students. Time begins now. Okay, so our group got a little bit bigger and you may need more time to process those three documents and that's fine because I'm going to put you in breakout groups and I want you to talk about those three documents and what a quality artifact may look like, feel like, and sound like for students. When you come to an agreement in your breakout groups on the Jamboard, we're going to go back and some of you have already started doing this, so you're gonna put in blue some add more to our thinking here. Okay, so I'm gonna put you in your breakout groups for about five minutes to discuss and make sure you keep adding to the Jamboard in your blue. What questions or concerns do you have? Okay, five minutes begins. So have we discussed what a quality backpack item may look like, feel like, and sound like for students? Yeah, so neither one of us, um, Michaela and I both were, I look like absolute garbage this morning, so it's just not happening yet. But um, Michaela and I, of course, both work at Newburgh, and we're in really different situations. Um, Michaela is our um, e teacher, and I'm the beta director, so we have, um, you know, my principal said, you know, van, put something in the backpack. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, um, so, and of course, being a related arts person, I'm a singleton. Um, you know, my world is completely different than everyone else's, and Michaela's children are unlike any children that most of us have ever encountered before. So to get them to even have something in their backpack is a win. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're talking about what are some things that we can do or um, what are we doing to determine like what's the best thing for them to put in their backpacks. Um, so I said that um, a kid should be able to get up with one of their artifacts and be able to justify it so well that they send them straight on to high school. Mm -hmm. um, so what type of thing for me or for Michaela is going to be that thing? What are those things that we can start working towards, I guess? Yeah. Especially since we're in such different situations. Yes. Um, and just so you know, this is a math focused. So 
I can tell you more from a math perspective, like so for in band, anything to do with fractions because you have your quarter notes, your eighth notes, you know, the different breakdown of the sure. So if a student can relate that to their fraction work, it's that in sixth grade, there's an entire unit, unit four, that's all about dividing fractions. So yeah. making that connection during that unit and hopefully they can, the student connects that and maybe they write a new piece because they found equivalent fractions and make that connection, that, that would be a, a nice overlap there. Um, and I'm gonna talk about these end of unit tasks that we have. Um, mm -hmm. They're already created, but that doesn't mean that you have to follow those. Th those are the opportunity to bring in your related arts, to bring in your multicultural education opportunities. So that's a really good time to collaborate with your math teachers and see how you can do um, something cross-curricular maybe. That's all. I mean, even though this is math specific and we're not necessarily math specific people, we know nothing about the backpack. So we, oh. yeah, I okay. mean, well, I mean, we talk about it so much at school, but it's never like take Run time down for you. Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to yeah. make a note of that. Um, so then I can then get to the other content leads for related arts and uh, hopefully they can maybe put something together, get you more information too. Oh my gosh, that would be, I mean, and that goes for any related arts person I've ever, Spanish, um, uh, general music in elementary school, um, uh, just a little bit more guidance. Um, we are the forgotten children and that's okay, but the backpack's so important um, and we're keeping it, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me know that because then I can, you know, work with the team and help you guys get what you need. All right, I'm going to bring us back, so. Right. Good morning to everybody. We got some new people as we did that breakout. And um, just so those of you that just came um, in the chat, I have linked the slide deck so that you can get to that. We are on slide nine. And we were just looking at each of these three our, uh, PDFs and documents about the backpack. And then we were revising um, our original thoughts on what makes an artifact worthy to be put in the backpack. Um, so the yellow are what we originally thought, and the blue after conversations and reviewing those documents are things that we added to. And we are definitely doing a, um, getting much more detail and information about what makes a quality artifact. So this is good. So it takes time. It connects to the academic standards and the backpack success skills, like there's a connection there. Um, they are grade level and rigorous and work that requires students to use the material and reflect on what they did. And it should be where students are collaborating with each other, learning from each other, and things that they are interested in and passionate about. So those are all things that we need to keep in mind when looking for backpack artifacts. So this is great. You may even add more to it because you're still going to have access to all of this, the slide deck and the Jamboard even when we leave. So this could be your note taking place where you want to add to for what makes a quality artifact as we move along. Were there any, I know that we had some questions about related arts and I'm going to get back to my related art content leads to talk about backpack. Um, are there any other questions, comments, or concerns before we start digging into how this appears in the IM program? Okay. Just stop me if I go too fast or we need more um, time. <laughs> what components of the IM program have you experienced that show qualities or potentials to be a backpack artifact? So we're gonna go to page two of the Jamboard and I want you to remember these things and how we also discussed that the balanced math program is a balance of conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, and application. So thinking of that balance, thinking of your experiences with the IM program, you're gonna to go to page two, and here's our question. What components of the IM program have you experienced that show qualities or potential to be backpack artifacts? And then just use a post-it and you can uh, write it on the Jamboard. I'm gonna give about three minutes for us to start posting ideas and feel free to comment on each other's as well.
So I see some responses from our numbers and math routines thing. Love to see that. Okay. Nope, stop that. Excuse me. So lots of good ideas here, talking about the student collaboration and the student discussions that they have. The putting it all together task at the end, we're gonna talk about those. The number talks, info gaps, we're gonna talk a little bit more about those as well. Um, we did have a question, how can we get kids to buy into the backpack? So feel free to unmute or type in the chat any successes you've had on how you've gotten kids to buy into the backpack. And you can either unmute or, or chat. And maybe you have a further question, and that's okay. The only time I seem to have any success, and it wasn't the um, creation of the backpack artifact rather than uploading it, was when I had them create a list of things we had done in math class that could be backpack artifacts, wrote a list out on the board, and then they got to choose what they put up in there, or put in the backpack. And that kind of gave you some buy-in in the uploading process. Okay. But in the creation of the artifact itself, I... That that's is, still a struggle? Like, yeah. that's still... Okay. I've had some success with kids when they, uh, they create something in class, and then I go, ooh, let's put that in your backpack because it fits for this, this, and this, because we'll you know, point it out. And they're like, oh, they didn't know they were creating a backpack artifact, but now they're excited. And every other kid around me who heard me say that is also like, ooh, can I do mine too? Uh, so that, that gets them into it sometimes too. Good. And I, th I think you guys are right. So it's, it's going to be something that we're going to have to teach them on what to look for, especially in math because this seems to be where everybody is struggling and it's because of our balanced approach. Um, so just like Kathleen said, whenever you see them working on something being like, oh, that would be a great backpack artifact. Like, I hope that you upload that. Um, and then uh, Chanel talked about putting a list of things, like let's develop a list of things that we think we could use in our backpack. And if they don't create what, some things that you're thinking about, you add them to the list and say, well, think about this activity. How did, you, how did your thinking change? How did your approach change from the beginning to the end of that process? What backpacks of skills did you work on? Um, what I've seen at a lot of schools, I don't know if any of your schools have this, but they don't just have their learning target, but they have a backpack of success skills learning target. So like they focus on one or two of those backpack of success skills within that lesson. So students are starting to see the connection from just the daily lesson in the backpack of success skills and what they're doing. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to be something we teach them and that can be worked through with the PLC, you know, by PLC, we can come help you build that um, or um, teacher by teacher. So if you want help in how to bring a focus to that, just reach out to me or my coach, Casey Watson. He will be back on Friday, Friday. Yes, this Friday. So you can reach out to us and we'll be happy to come and discuss ways that we can help you get your students excited or bought into the, the backpack of success skills. Um, we're here to help you. Okay, I have a question. Uh huh. How much time should we allot to these backpack artifacts? So uh, we're going to talk about it in math, and I think you're going to see that it's it's already there. It's just we have to really point it out a lot more to them, and it looks a little different in math than it would in other subject areas. Um, and so, like, do I want, wouldn't you spending a lot of time? No, because that takes away from those meaningful learning experiences. Right. But could there be a time at the end of the unit? Like, um, so, you know, after the assessment, I would give the assessment back and let kids do an assessment corrections so that they could learn from their mistakes and re-engage with the material. That day may also be a unit reflection. So let's think about the, the entire unit from where we started to where we are now. And let's just think about what backpack artifacts do we have and start, we can use that time to upload it. 
Um, I think you probably, you're going to have to build in some time for them to reflect and upload within class time. Should it be like an entire class period? Probably not. You know, maybe spend 20, 30 minutes of, of part of a class, allowing them to reflect and think about what they've been doing. But if we don't provide that time for them to purposely reflect on their learning and what could be a backpack artifact, then they're going to struggle to upload and think about what could be a backpack artifact. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, we're going to have where we're supposed to once we get back. So we're supposed to have longer class periods. So I feel like that'll help us, you know, take care of them having the extra time to yeah. do that. Yeah. Because until we get it, like, I mean, we're, what, is this our third year? And so your sixth graders have had it in sixth and seventh grade. So maybe eighth grade, hopefully now it's a little bit better. Um, it's, but if we don't take the time to point it out, then it's going to be a struggle as we keep going. So build in some time, just not all the time or the majority of your time. Okay. So here's a list. And this is just a few things that we taught, we quickly came up with of potential backpack artifacts that are within the IM program. The number talks, info gaps, if you came to the math routines one, you heard us talk a little bit about those. The card sorts justification, once they are, when they're participating in those card sorts. The end of unit task, the putting it all together task. And a sequence of lessons, the, like the essential concept development. The one that immediately pops out to me for sequence of lessons is in the sixth grade, developing that long division algorithm, because there's about five lessons where that sequence, they go from base 10 to that algorithm. So that sequence there is a great backpack artifact because their thinking changed from using base 10 blocks to getting to that algorithm. So we're going to talk a little bit about these. So I want you to think about number talks, info gap, and card sort justification. And we say that these create conversation and collaboration. Okay. So why is a conversation and collaboration a quality backpack artifact? So I want you to think about that. Why would these be quality backpack artifacts? And using this poll everywhere, you can either go to this link you have to type it and respond, or you text this number, 37607. You text it, Sarah Downs 443. And then when it responds back to you, then you can type your response into this question. And we'll be able to see everybody's response. So I'm going to give you about two, three minutes for you to respond, and then we'll discuss. Okay. Excellent responses, guys. You got it. I mean, this is right on point. They have to collaborate and communicate. They're going to have to dig deeper. They have to make those connections between the different strategies. They're high in rigor. They um, have to be clear when answering and asking questions of their partner. They have to share their reasoning. Absolutely. So one thing that will help you in determining backpack artifacts is using these performance outcomes. I can get to them. And that's what I did on the next slide. I'm going to show you what we as a math team say for why these are backpack artifacts. And what I did is I came here to the performance outcomes and I pulled language directly from there. And because this is what students have to be able to do during their defense. So if I'm looking, if that's what they have to be able to do, then this is my success criteria as to if it's going to be a quality backpack artifact for that student. So as a math team, you, I mean, you guys said it already. Number talk. Oh, wait, sorry. Number talks. They have to construct clear and accurate claims. They're refining their vocabulary. They're analyzing the appropriateness of their strategy. They're explaining the connections. They're applying a new strategy because they may have learned from a, the first prompt a new strategy that they want to try. They're comparing and contrasting their varying perspectives that their peers took, and they have to reflect and describe what was learned. So in a, just a number talk, a student could easily do that because their thinking has changed over a sequence of 
um, prompts. InfoGap, very, very similar. They have to generate those clear and precise questions. They have to analyze information from sources. So they have a source and their partner is a source and they have to determine and through communication, determine what information they need. They have to select and implement the appropriate strategy. Then they have to reflect and describe what was learned. They're gonna compare and contrast their strategy use to their partner strategy use. And again, we're still working on adapting our language and using that grade level vocabulary. Card sort justification. They're looking at the cards. They're determining the information from the, the, their cards, determine what is the appropriate sequence or what, how can I sort these cards? They have to select and implement the appropriate strategies. Some of them require them to make connections between the different strategies. They have to think about their partner and what their partner is sharing and compare and contrast their perspective with theirs. Constructing their clear and accurate claims, analyze impact of their contributions because it's usually a group of two sometimes and you may have a group of four. So did they contribute to the group? And they have to use their math language and representations. So all of these came directly from the performance outcomes. So this is why a number talk info gap and a card sort justifications are all considered quality backpack artifacts. When we do these with our kids, after we do them, this is when Kathleen's approach of, this would be a great backpack artifact comes into play. Because you have to put that thought into their head. Like, this is a good quality backpack artifact. How did your thinking change? How did you grow as a learner from the beginning to the end? How did your thinking change? Because like info gaps and number talks, they're throughout. Um, and info gaps usually at the end. How did your thinking change from the beginning of the unit to the end of the unit? And start prompting them to think about those things. What questions, comments, concerns do you have about using number talks, info gaps, and card sorts for a quality backpack artifact? I see shaking heads like we're good, so. Okay. <laughs> so then this one, I've already had some questions. So the learning progressions, the end of unit task and the sequence of tasks. We call these learning progressions. So thinking about these three documents, backpack where the artifacts, quality work protocol, the performance outcomes, and our balance of a math program, why would a learning progression be considered a quality backpack artifact? So we're gonna do poll everywhere again. You should be able to just respond this time um, if you texted. And I'm gonna give you about two minutes to respond. Okay. Again, you guys nailed it. It's all about that growth and progression and showing them what they've learned from the beginning to the end of unit. Those end of tasks, they get to put it all together and really show what they've done. So yes, absolutely. You guys have nailed it right there. Um, here is what I pulled from the performance indicators. When we think of backpack artifacts and they're saying over a sequence of time, that's what we're talking about for these end of unit tasks and those sequence of tasks. Because at the beginning of the unit, they had some knowledge. And then throughout the, the unit, they learned new strategies. They learned to connect those strategies. So they learned to progress from that conceptual understanding to that procedural fluency. And those sequence of tasks that are laid out that allow that is that progression of learning that shows how they started and how they adapted and worked in communicating with others and through the task and those uh, card sorts and just the problem-based approach, their, their learning changed to where it is now. Um, end of unit task, that depends on how you plan and implement the end of unit task. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about those on the next slide, um, but the sequence of tasks is where I've had some questions. So one of the most powerful backpack um, defenses I was in a student was talking about his artwork and he actually had an artifact from his sixth grade art class 
and he showed it. He goes, you know, when I was in sixth grade, I wasn't a good artist. Like, look at this. There's, there's no shadows. This is just lines. I didn't know how to do the shading. You know, I just did not know what I was doing. And as I progressed, you know, in seventh and eighth grade, and then this year in eighth grade, I really focused on the shading. And so here's my eighth grade artifact. So he showed where he began in sixth grade, and then he showed where he ended in eighth grade. And he talked about the experiences that he had in class and throughout his middle school career that allowed him to transform from the artist he was in sixth grade to the artist that he was in eighth grade that got him this amazing artifact. And it was like I was blown away. <laughs> I was like, you drew that? Like, that's not just a computer? Like, that's amazing. Um, and so that is what the backpack of success skills is all about. It's how the student transformed as a learner throughout the learning experiences he had to create these backpack artifacts. So when I talk about a sequence of tasks, that's what I'm talking about. At the beginning of the unit, where did they start? Then at the end of the unit, when we went from conceptual understanding through that procedural fluency to that application, after that deep dive into those concepts, where did we end up? And that's why I say the sixth grade um, long division unit, I think it's unit five, where they developed the long division algorithm. Because at the beginning, they're working with base 10 blocks. So that's their artifact, like that's base 10 blocks. As they progress, they start to learn the partial quotients method. So their strategy is changing. They're getting to be more efficient. They're learning how the base 10 and partial quotients are connected. And then at the end, they finally get to that long division algorithm, which is the most efficient method, but they're able to connect that algorithm to the base 10 blocks in that partial quotient method. And so a student can show, you know, at the beginning of this unit, this is how I was thinking, but then I learned about the partial quotients method and that made it so much easier because I didn't have to draw the base 10 blocks out anymore. And so then I got really good at the partial quotients and I even shared with my neighbor how to do it so that we were a little bit more efficient because he kept drawing. So, you know, we talked about how the hundreds, we could just think about, well, I know there's six hundreds and there's three groups, so that's two hundreds in each group. And then we learned the, the long division algorithm. And so then now this is how I do long division. And I'm so much more efficient at it and I can just get through a lot more problems more quickly now so that I can actually get to do something else or whatever your task is for them. And so a big part of this is explaining their strengths and how they adapt their thinking and pick the strategy based on the context that's provided to them. So that's why we recommend the sequence of tasks. Before, and we'll talk about end of unit task on the next one, but what questions, comments, concerns do you have about learning progressions and how they show up in IM and how they could be quality backpack artifacts? Um, I was just wondering, like, and I probably couldn't answer my own question, but um, I watched some of the backpack defenses last year and the kids, you know, they have to make a presentation. So I was just wondering, like, what it might look like to use the sequence of tasks visually. So they would just have, um, like, the first task, their first attempt at it. And then they would have another task at the end to show that sequence of concrete to abstract thinking. So the first one's probably going to be a very concrete type of thing. So there'll maybe pictures, tape diagrams, double number lines. And then towards the end, you're probably going to see more of an algorithm. And then they can also show how they applied that algorithm to the task. So maybe they created a budget based off of using their application, the algorithms of the mathematics. So they're gonna be similar, but they're not gonna be exactly the same. So um, like I said, the one student had a sixth grade artifact and then he had an eighth grade artifact. They weren't the same picture, but he talked about the lines and stuff. So in math, it may be, this is what I did first and look at all the work that I did and all these pictures and it took a lot of time and now, here I did the division very quickly and I was able to create this budget and then they talk about what happened in between. 
Okay. So you use the, the beginning and the end as your anchors, and then the student discusses the sequence of those tasks that led to the end. Does that make sense? Does that kind of yeah. help? Okay. And, and that's something that we have to help them do because they're not going to just do that on their own. Like we have to kind of coach them through that process. Okay. So the end of unit tasks are built in. We even use those. Um, we worked with the deeper learning team and talked about how the, each unit is actually a project-based learning unit because of the end of unit task. That's your, the end of unit task is your project. And then you already have your small group instruction pieces laid out within the unit. Like these are, that's what the individual lessons would be. So you can develop the end of unit task into a project. Um, there's the one in, sorry, I know sixth grade really well because that's what I spent most of my first few years working with it. Um, there's an end of unit task or, um, called um, planning a dinner party. And that one, you can easily develop that into a project. Now, when I looked at it, I was like, people don't do dinner parties. Not everybody goes to a dinner party. So how can I adapt that? to be a multicultural education opportunity. And I turned it into um, planning a celebration. So right in middle school, you know, you have your Hispanic population with the quinceañeras, so they could be thinking of how they're gonna plan that. Um, you have Sweet 16, they're getting close to that. Um, so they can start thinking about that. Maybe it's just a birthday party. Um, at Newburgh, you guys have your color run, right? Is, do you still have that? Um, so planning that color run, how can you plan that so that you can bring in those multicultural pieces into that? Um, that's where I recommend you, you don't have to follow exactly what it says on those end of unit tests. That's your opportunity to turn it into something that is relatable to students and that they, that's where you can bring in those multicultural pieces into it. The other idea I want you to think about is the standard progressions. And this is gonna go vertical. So this is not just gonna be within a grade level, this is gonna be across the grade levels. Because this is how our standards are different from the other uh, content standards. We give a little bit each year and do a deep dive within that little bit each year. So think of equations. Sixth grade does one-step equations. They think about balance. How do we keep things balanced? Then in seventh grade, we do two-step equations. Then in eighth grade, we get to multi-step equations. So we're working on equations over the course of three years. So how can I use that standard progression and develop it into something where they do something in sixth grade? Then we take that project from sixth grade and work on it in seventh grade. And then in seventh grade, we take that project and do something with it in eighth grade. Um, Mazik Middle School has this um, cross-curricular opportunity that they do with their PE health class, where in sixth grade, they use the unit rates and they find um, the nutritional information for a, um, a recipe. So they just focus on a recipe and develop the nutritional information for that recipe. How many calories is in it? And then how many calories, like how long do I have to work out to burn off those calories? So they could do that in sixth grade. Then in seventh grade, she kind of does the same project, but they go deeper. So now not only is it just one recipe, but they're developing a healthy menu and then the budget to go along with it. So how much does it cost to make this muffin? And then how much do I need to mark that muffin up in order for me to make a profit? So that's what they would do in seventh grade. And then in eighth grade, they could take it and turn it into a systems of equations. So the cost of my supplies versus the um, how much I'm selling products for. When is that break even point? And do a cost analysis on their menu and the items that they're providing. So think about those progressions that are vertically because that was where you're going to be able to develop something from sixth, seventh, and then into eighth grade. The other one is ratio and proportions in sixth and seventh grade, because then that goes on to um, eighth grade to talk about the systems. 
Um, you have your equations, that's six, seventh, and then statistics and probability. So sixth and seventh grade, statistics and probability, you can easily get it started in sixth grade, and then they continue that again in seventh grade. And then in eighth grade, it kind of goes a little bit different because of how the standard shifts, but it's something that they could start exploring. So what questions do you have about backpack artifacts and I am? Okay. This will be my first year teaching sixth grade. I've always taught seventh and eighth grade. So take your example on the one-step equations. And so if we do an artifact with one-step equations, we should emphasize that you can take this artifact and take it through seventh grade and take it through eighth grade, correct? Yes. And then I would also, like, if you really want it to be powerful, it's going to require that vertical PLC. You're going to have to work with your seventh grade and eighth grade teachers to develop that. So maybe this year you're just exploring and you're setting that foundation. So then seventh, next year, the seventh grade, then take what you started and develop it further. And then the next year, the eighth grade can do it, like take it and take it further. But you, you need to let those seventh and eighth grade teachers know so that they're like, okay, I know that she specifically did this as a backpack artifact and told kids to do it. So then now I can progress it and show that progression and have kids add to it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would, I would tell you, I think those vertical progressions, if you really want to sort like a high quality backpack artifact that is just going to blow the pants off of people, that's where it's going to happen because there's so much development in the standards across our grade levels that they, they just learn so much. Um, and that, that's, that's what's been hard when we explain to our leadership, like this is how math is different. Our progressions are not in one grade level. Like we don't go this sequence in this one topic. It's over the course and span of grade levels. So it's just something to think about. It, and maybe that, that may be a big ask right now. So just start with what you guys can manage and go from there. Okay. All right. So the rest of the time that I have is for you guys to start planning and looking at those opportunities.